Well, I didn't want to have to tell you this, but Disney World might be giving you a bad deal on your upcoming vacation. So how can you avoid losing money on a trip that already costs so much in the first place? Don't worry, we are here to help you out. We got your back today on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Now, even before you make it onto Disney property, you've got a whole lot of costly decisions to make. And then when you're in the midst of your most magical vacation, you've got even more costly decisions to make. But be warned, not everything Disney pitches to you is going to be worth that cost, even if it's supposedly more convenient or listed as a potentially cheaper price point than before. So how can you make sure you're not getting tricked into paying for something that's actually going to make your Disney World vacation worse? That's what we're unearthing today. Since we've all been there, done that, and regretted many Disney purchases before here on the DFB team. It's one of our main ways we bond, through regret. Not really, but sometimes. You know we make all the mistakes so that you don't have to. All right, first crummy deal in Disney World coming at ya. Purchasing Genie Plus when it's cheaper. Now, my strategy isn't often to say when the price is high, buy, but Disney Genie Plus is the exception to this. Much like hotel prices and ticket prices and even flight prices, Genie Plus, which helps you bypass the lines for Disney attractions, has price points that fluctuate based on potential demand. Genie Plus prices start at $15 per day, but can get as high as $39 per day so far. Same thing goes for the individual Lightning Lane prices for the more popular Disney rides that you'll have to pay a separate ticket price for if you want to bypass their queues. If the demand isn't there, those prices will drop, but if the demand is predicted to get pretty wild, the prices will skyrocket. You can probably see where I'm going with this, right? If you notice that Genie Plus is being advertised at its lowest price point in the parks, then more than likely the crowd levels aren't going to be too bad that day, and you'll probably get on rides okay without having to wait an absurd amount of time for each one. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the time you'll most need Disney Genie Plus is when you're seeing those prices get into the $26 plus per person range because Disney knows the crowd levels that day are going to be escalated. You'll be able to purchase Genie Plus starting at midnight each day of your visit, which doesn't give you a whole lot of heads up about which park days you're going to need to budget for. Will you need it for just one park day? Two days? All days? My best piece of advice for you is always to plan for the most expensive possibility. Gross, right? But effective. So for instance, if you're planning on four park days, prepare to pay $39 extra per person for each one just in case the need for Genie Plus arises. I'm not saying you're going to have to pay that much for Genie Plus, nor will you have to pay for each day of your visit or even each park. But it's better to have those safety net funds handy just in case you got to use them. Best case scenario, you save too much money and now you get to use it for something else like souvenirs or fancy drinks or I don't know, your next Disney trip. Now, if you're hesitant about paying for Genie Plus right when it goes live at midnight, you can always purchase it later on, but I wouldn't exactly recommend it. Lightning lanes start to go live at 7 a.m. to help you get a head start with your park day. And once the parks open up, you'll be able to grab even more lightning lanes all day long. You can even stack lightning lanes if the lightning lane that you last grab doesn't have a return time until way later on in the day. You can select another one after a two hour cool down period. Time has passed if you haven't gotten the chance to use your previously selected lightning lane yet. I know, I'm just blah blahing at this point, but don't worry. Your My Disney Experience app is going to let you know when you can make another Lightning Lane selection, so you don't have to overthink it. All of this to say, if you wait too late to purchase Disney Genie Plus, you're going to be paying the same price for this service for fewer Lightning Lane selections and more limited return time options rather than someone else who purchased it before 7 a.m. As a chronic procrastinator myself, this is me telling you that procrastination and Genie Plus never work hand in hand. You're just going to have to be clear about this decision. Either you buy it or you don't. Just don't decide at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon during your Magic Kingdom day that you want to give Lightning Lanes a try because you're going to wind up spending extra money on more limited benefits. Now, this is something that's in my craw personally, so I'm going to throw it in this video for you. Same price, worse dining experience. When you pay for a meal at Disney World, you're not always going to get the same exact dining experience that someone else is going to get. Couple of examples for you. If you book a buffet at the end of the night, it's going to cost the same amount as someone who books the exact same buffet for like three in the afternoon. But when you eat a buffet toward closing time, you might notice that the buffet line isn't going to be replenished as often as it would have been during peak times because there's just fewer people eating, leaving you with potentially bottom of the barrel options. 
And yet, to flip the script here, if you're booking a character buffet for the end of the night versus the afternoon, you might find that the characters are a whole lot more attentive to your table since they don't have as big of a lunch or dinner rush to worry about because there's not as many people dining. So then you kind of just have to weigh your options. Is a later character buffet reservation worth the potential extra character time if it means sacrificing potentially food quality? Or is it better to stick with the afternoon rush and get less character time but better food quality? Decisions. Now, how about where you end up getting seated at the restaurant? You might not think that it'd matter much in the end until you're stuck at a seat right next to the bathrooms or the kitchen where the door keeps flinging open and pots and pans keep clattering and it's super bright light when it's supposed to be like a chill, relaxing restaurant or behind a barrier like at Ohana at Disney's Polynesian Village Resort where you can't see the fireworks at all. And yet here you are paying the very same amount of money to eat here as the family who's sitting right next to the windows, getting a picture perfect view of the happily ever after spectacular. It's never a bad idea to put in a table request when you check into your dining reservation, but just keep in mind that seating requests can't always be fulfilled. Voicing your request to the host up front is going to improve your chances of being seated where you want to be sat, since the cast members now have a good idea of your particular preference and will do their very best to make it happen if they can. Don't know which seats you even need to be asking for in the first place? We've got a whole list of best places to sit at 53 Disney World restaurants featured in a post on our DFB site. I'll link it down in the description below for you just in case you want to take a peek. Yep, that's the kind of thing we spend our time on. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about paying rack rate for your hotel room. Seriously, a value resort room is still how much? There's a lot to love about the Disney World hotels. The price point though is not one of those things. The price you initially see for each of these resorts doesn't have to be the price you end up paying though. There's almost always some sort of deal going on via the Disney World website for their hotels. So don't make the mistake of paying full price for a room on property when more than likely you can pay hundreds of dollars less. For example, there's a current featured offer on Disney's special offers, deals, and discounts page for guests vacationing on most nights between March 25th to July 7th, 2024. This discount is going to save you 30% on rooms at certain hotels when you stay five nights or longer. Now don't get thrown by that initial marketing language if you're planning on a shorter Disney vacation, because if you click on the actual discount featured, you'll learn what the rest of this deal includes. For shorter stays, you can still save up to 25% on your hotel rooms, so that's pretty sneaky Disney. But the lesson here is always read the fine print before you keep on scrolling and never pay rack rate for your room. Okay, sorry about this one, but I have to include it. We are a Disney food blog and that means that the Disney dining plan has to go into these videos of the worst deals. There are some folks out there who will come to the Disney dining plan's defense any chance you get. And I get that. There's still a lot of love when it comes to pre-purchasing all your Disney meals ahead of your trip, especially when it comes to convenience. But for others, the Disney dining plan can feel less like convenience and more like a ripoff. If you don't know the ins and outs of maximizing the Disney dining plan, you may very well end up paying a lot of money for what you eat and drink around the parks and you didn't even want that much food in the first place. So yeah, the Disney dining plan could be worth it depending on your circumstances, but you could also wind up paying for way more food than you wanted to eat. I know I say this all the time on these videos, but Disney is not dumb when it comes to marketing. They are not going to put out a discount plan that's not gonna make them money. The Disney dining plan has been constructed based on a lot of research. So they know how much people eat in the parks and they've created the dining plan to be right at the top level of what people eat in the park. So that means that the majority of people don't eat that much food. So they're getting you to pay for a lot of food that you probably aren't gonna wanna eat. Now, I know I've said that three times in this point, but anyway, this is something that I just really like to drive home. Disney's not dumb. They're not going to put something out there that's going to cost them a bunch of money. So if you're gonna buy Disney Dining Plan, buy it for the convenience alone. Don't buy it for the money savings. Now, fortunately, we do have some handy resources to help you decide if the Disney Dining Plan is going to be right for you. If you're ready to learn more about it, make sure to check out our Disney Dining Plan playlist over on the DFB channel. And you can also purchase the DFB Guide to Maximizing the Disney Dining Plan, which goes even further into planning each of your meals around the Disney Dining Plan and how you can stretch those dining credits to really get your money's worth out of them. You can purchase this guide today over at dfbstore.com. Just make sure to type in code YouTube before you check out to save some money. 
Now, this next one, I actually kind of hate talking about this one too, because it throws one of my favorite Disney World hotels under the bus. But I have to for you and the sake of your trip. So here I go. Disney's deluxe resorts can be worth the super steep price point if you're planning on using all those deluxe resort perks to your advantage. But one of the big selling points for many Disney deluxe resorts are their easy to get around transportation options like you'll find with deluxe resorts on the monorail loop, super easy to get to Magic Kingdom, super easy to get to Epcot, or Riviera Resort, which has its own Skyliner station, but to be fair, so does Caribbean Beach and Pop Century now. In Art of Animation, they cost a lot less than Riviera. Anyway, different point. Or the Epcot area resorts, which are literally steps away from Epcot's International Gateway. But other deluxe resorts don't make getting around Disney World as easy. You can't walk to parks, you can't jump on the monorail, you can't jump on the Skyliner, but you're still paying an arm and a leg for them. Take Old Key West and Saratoga Springs, for example. Both of these deluxe resorts have boat transportation to Disney Springs, but when it comes to actually getting you to the parks, you're only free transportation will be to track down the buses. And there's a lot of bus stops at these resorts, meaning these buses are going to make multiple stops around the hotel to pick up multiple guests before finally heading out to the park. The same can be said about my beloved Disney Deluxe Resort Animal Kingdom Lodge. Forgive me, Dackle, for speaking ill of you, but I have to look at all these people. I don't want them to go into this blind. Yep, this hotel is gorgeous. It has live animals on property. It has some of the best Disney food resort wide. But when it comes to getting you from place to place, this hotel is super far away from just about everything except Animal Kingdom. And your only option for getting anywhere is using the buses, which again, falls victim to the dreaded bus loop, meaning you'll have to set aside extra time when you're trying to get anywhere so you can plan for that potential bus stop delay. Now, granted, you're only going to Kidani village and back or jumbo house and back but still it takes a little bit of extra time so anytime you want to go to magic kingdom that's going to probably be like a 45 minute to an hour journey from animal kingdom lodge and when you're spending that much money especially for a savannah view room whew, that's a rough one now, if one of the main reasons you're wanting to book a deluxe Disney resort is to take advantage of easy transportation services so you can quickly get around the theme parks or even walk to them, then you're not gonna wanna prioritize a hotel that's not gonna do you any favors in that regard. In fact, even some of the resort offerings that do have easy access to select parks still may not be the best option for your specific trip. For example, if you're planning on spending multiple days at Hollywood Studios, then having monorail access at Magic Kingdom isn't gonna do you much good. You'd be much better off reserving a hotel at even a value resort over on the Skyliner route like Art of Animation or Pop Century instead of paying $600 plus per night for a transportation perk you're not even gonna take advantage of. But it's also important to keep in mind that even if you don't book a room at a certain Disney Resort, Values, Moderates, Deluxes, that you're still allowed to visit those resorts. Yep, you can go to any hotel you want, even if you're not staying there. So before you purchase a Disney hotel just for its transportation perks, make sure you know exactly what those perks are so you don't end up dropping 600 plus per night on a hotel stay that's not going to do you any favors when you're trying to quickly get from point A to point B. Okay, so stop buying things because the weather hates you. <laughs> now, when you fantasize about vacationing in Florida, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe even before you start thinking about the Disney parks. For me, it was always palm trees and swimming in the pool and sunshine because I grew up up north and actually going someplace in March that you could swim was like amazing. Now, I know for a lot of you, it's the weather as well. More specifically, that's sunshine because it is the sunshine state after all. So you'd think you'd always be getting a healthy dose of vitamin D when you're there. But these delusions of sunshiny grandeur can really trip you up if you're not prepared for Florida's other moodier weather, like the rain, for instance. On most days in Orlando, you might run into at least a scattering of afternoon showers during your otherwise picture perfect day at least between the months of like April and November. But then there are those Orlando days when the rain starts up and just doesn't stop, leaving you in the most magical place on earth, all soggy and cold. Fortunately, you can still get your money's worth out of a plain old rainy day in Disney. Many of the park's attractions do take place indoors, so you don't have to worry about everything closing up on you while the rain keeps coming down, but it's a lot harder to enjoy a rainy Disney day if you keep going into set indoor attractions, getting all dried off, and then being forced to go out and get all wet again as you're making it over to the next indoor attraction. Now, Disney does sell rainy day items in case you're in a soggy pinch like I have been in many, many times. I have so many Disney ponchos, I could probably wallpaper an entire room with them. 
And they also sell umbrellas and sweatshirts, since the indoor attractions will still be blasting the air conditioning on those stormy days, making all those buildings freezing cold when you're already soaked to the bone. But these items are gonna be way more expensive to purchase inside the parks when you're desperate for them, rather than just bringing them from home or getting them from a big box store ahead of time. The only thing is you gotta remember to bring them with you, which is half the battle when you've already got a thousand and one other things you've gotta do before you're Disney bound. Thus my millions of Disney ponchos. So we've got a detailed packing list already typed up for you to make it very, very, very easy. You can download it for free right now by scanning the QR code you see on the screen or by going to disneyfoodblog.com slash Disney plans. Not only will these worksheets give you a packing list, but they'll also give you a step-by-step -step timeline to help you plan ahead and make sure you've got your T's crossed and your I's dotted before it's time to hit the parks. You know how you wish you had like a personal assistant who could just manage all this stuff for you? That's what we are. <laughs> Go ahead and download those free worksheets. I promise they're gonna help. Okay, now how about paying for a trip you don't actually get to enjoy? Yep, it's me again. It's AJ talking to you about drinking water. <laughs> I always remind you to drink water, but I get on your case about this as often as I can because I've been there. I have wasted thousands of dollars because I didn't drink the free water. I got dehydrated and I had the worst headache of my life for the entire week I was in Disney World to the point that I had to cancel stuff and literally just take naps. So I know that for some people, that's that's the best vacation anyway, but when you're losing a bunch of money that you already spent, it kind of stinks. Like think about it, you pay hundreds for a hotel room, hundreds for theme park tickets, hundreds for transportation costs, and then you spend your first park day living off cold brew and margaritas only to develop a horrible headache and heat exhaustion before the day wraps up. Now, the rest of your trip is gonna be you trying to recover when you could have just listened to your body and stayed hydrated from the beginning. Most of all the quick service locations around property can give you free water cups to keep yourself hydrated all day long. And if you're worried about the taste of Florida water, you can always purchase some of those powdered flavor things ahead of your trip and that can help you flavor the water but you can get some with extra electrolytes and stuff to make you hydrated for longer if it works I don't know a lot of you say it doesn't work so maybe it doesn't work but anyway you can at least flavor the water now if you have a refillable water bottle you can also fill up on filtered water from Disney's free to use refill stations you can track these down alert brand new via the My Disney Experience app. Yes, that's right. We went into all of the parks to find all of those bottle refill stations to make a map for you. And then Disney put it on their website, not our map, they made their own map and they put it on the Disney Experience app. But anyway, that's great. It's awesome that you have that now. It's on the My Disney Experience app. Type in water bottle refill stations in the app search bar and find on the map. And then they're gonna show you all of the water bottle refill stations, which is amazing. Now, your last resort, Disney's got water bottles for purchase, but these can be a pretty bad dealio for your wallet since they cost like $5 plus each time you get one. That being said, desperate times call for desperate measures. And if you want to pay $5 for water in Disney, I'd rather you be hydrated than not. Just remember that there are cheaper routes you can turn to instead if you want to continue replenishing your electrolytes all trip long without racking up the big bucks each time you start to feel a little parched. Maybe you get one of those $5 water bottles and then use that bottle as a refillable bottle that you can use at the water refill stations for the rest of your trip. So I'm pretty sure Disney's favorite word lately is plus. You've got Genie Plus, Magic Band Plus, Disney Plus. They're also working on ESPN Plus, I think. And you've got Park Hopper Plus. But this extra expense should be the least of your plus up concerns, since it's not going to do you a whole lot of good in the grand scheme of your trip. When you purchase your theme park tickets, you've got the option to add Park Hopper benefits for an extra cost. That's going to allow you to jump between multiple parks on a single day. Now, regular Park Hoppers, not Park Hopper Plus, start Start at $65 per ticket with, once again, the possibility of spiking higher depending on demand. But if you want to get Park Hopper Plus for each of your tickets, you're looking at paying more for those with starting prices at $85. So what does the plus represent in Park Hopper Plus? Not only will you be able to jump between multiple parks each day, but you're also going to receive a number of plus up opportunities equal to your number of park ticket days. So here's an example. Let's say I have a four day park ticket. The Park Hopper Plus is gonna give me four extra visits for one of their other experiences, like one of their water parks, a round of golf at Disney's Oak Trail Golf Course, a round of mini golf at either Winter Summerland and or Fantasia Gardens, and 
that's pretty much it. But here's the thing. Each of these experiences costs less than $85 if you just want to pay for them outright. I mean, the mini golf courses cost $19 per adult and $12 per kid, and that's not that bad in the first place. Not to mention, if you're planning on going to Disney World in 2025 and staying in one of the Disney World resorts while you're there, then on the day of your hotel arrival, you're going to get into one of the Disney water parks for free. So you really won't need to spend any extra on a visit to one of those. So don't force yourself to purchase a park hopper just for these plus up benefits. Instead, pay for the type of park tickets you need and save a little extra money in case you want to tack on one of these other premium experiences without spending a whole lot of extra money for the Park Hopper Plus. There are very few people that are going to go to a water park every day in addition to a regular theme park every day, so not really the best use of money. All right, I'm being kind of fuddy-duddy with this one, but maybe I'm not, maybe. You can be the judge. If you pick up a passport during one of the Epcot festivals and flip to the back of it, you're gonna find a tasting challenge specific to that particular festival. The challenge is gonna list off a number of different foods or drinks that you can find around the festival food booths. Typically, if you try five of the items in the challenge and get your passport stamped, then you can redeem your passport for a complimentary snack prize. So I'm not trying to bash these festival challenges. They're fun, we do them all the time. And yes, you feel this nice sense of accomplishment after it's all said and done and stamped. But if you're doing this challenge all by your lonesome just to get that prize, the snack prizes are usually like a cookie or like like a Dole Whip or something like that. And you've just eaten five items, each worth $5. So you'll be picking up a prize that's A, not really free because you were kind of prompted to pay for lots of treats before that. And B, you no longer have the stomach space for it. So Epcot's festival food challenges are best attempted either in a group, since you'll still earn a stamp on your passport no matter who ends up eating the food item in the end, or broken up over the course of multiple park days, if your vacation timeline allows for that. After all, there is no set challenge timeline you're going to need to adhere to. You can do that festival food challenge at your own speed, even if that means hopping over to Epcot once each day, or maybe you visit Disney World a couple of times during that festival even if they're weeks apart or months. So if you're looking for a festival specific challenge that'll cost you less to complete and will earn you a souvenir that you can actually take home with you and won't melt within minutes of you earning it. Though yes, sometimes those Dole Whips come with a little plastic cup that you can take home, I guess. Anyway, each Epcot festival also has a themed scavenger hunt that you can purchase at one of the main park gift shops like World Traveler, Creations, or Port of Entry, or Disney Traders. These boards cost about $10 each, and they're gonna send you out on a cute little hunt to track down characters hiding around the World Showcase pavilions. Prizes will vary depending on the festival, but you don't even have to wait and redeem a completed scavenger hunt board if you just wanna pick up your prize along with the board. You can always assume you're gonna be a champion, and Epcot will trust you enough to hand over your prize upon purchase. Okay, get your party shoes on and your hair slicked back because we are going clubbing. Okay, we're not clubbing like that. Rather, we're going to hit the club level scene at Disney World's bougiest hotels and see if paying all that extra money is going to be worth the VIP status to book the concierge rooms. Spoiler alert, it can be worth it, but it isn't always. Let's back up a sec. What is a club level hotel stay in the first place? Well, club level is a special room category at some Disney resort hotels that offers extra perks. So if you're staying in club level accommodations, you have access to a special lounge that offers snacks and beverages throughout the day. While these offerings vary by resort, typically you're going to find light continental style breakfast options in the morning, snacks and beverages in the afternoon, and small dishes as well as wine, beer, and cocktails in the evening. Now this includes some hot foods too, so you can really have an entire meal in the lounge. Now those who book a club level room also receive planning help before their visit and a dedicated concierge desk on site to help you get any last minute advanced dining reservations and other vacation add-ons like tours or dessert parties but you gotta pay for all that stuff it's not like you're gonna get it for free because you're staying club level and that all sounds fine and dandy but let's not forget that a vip status like this doesn't just get handed to you you gotta pay for it club level rooms look the same as other non-club level type rooms across each of the resorts with options that could include studios or standard or deluxe or suites however you're often going to be paying 200 to 600 dollars more per night for the club level privilege so since the club level rooms aren't going to be any different than any other room at the resort not to mention those who get access to the concierge cast members 
might experience the same level of excellent service in the lobby at the regular resort concierge desk, then the biggest club level perk you're really gonna be receiving here is that private lounge access. If you're trying to take a more leisurely Disney vacation, then yes, having this resort perk can be absolutely worth it. Club level lounges are well kept, they offer tasty treats, and maybe most importantly, they can be pretty quiet, eh, sometimes. On the flip side of things, if you're a park commando and you or your family regularly leave your resort before sunrise and make rope drop, then stay in the park scene until after the fireworks, then you're missing out on the best and probably only reason to book a club level stay, since the lounge and the concierge services are only available between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. If you want to experience a club level stay but hate the idea of sacrificing a lot of time in the parks just to get your money's worth out of your pricey room, consider doing a split stay. That way you can dip your toe in the club level water for one or two nights toward the tail end of your trip, but stay in a more moderately priced resort or room for the first part of your vacation when you're hitting the parks full force. Now here at DFB, we're a good Disney deals only safe zone. So make sure to keep coming back here to check with us. We're gonna continue to provide you with the best Disney World opportunities that'll be worth your time and your money and your energy. That's why we get up every morning to make sure you have a good Disney trip. And don't forget about our free Disney planning worksheets, which you can download right now over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney plans. It's got that packing list in it for you and a bunch of other really cool stuff. So go check it out. It's totally free. And we also welcome your feedback on all that stuff. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.